Thanks for coming today to, to see one of our um, amazing adjunct faculty, um, Professor Catherine Brown, talk about her latest book, which I'm sure you read about in the in the advertisement for the event. Um, but such an impressive career already. Um, White House, Kabul, and sort of like all things in between. And we're super, really lucky to have her um, as one of the adjuncts here. So without further ado, I'm gonna let her take it away with her presentation, yeah. but um, it's so good to have you. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Oh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back um, on campus. I normally teach in the spring, and um, well, I taught in the fall for a little bit, one of your core classes, but then I uh, have my own class in the spring, and, and I am, my husband and I are expecting, so I won't be teaching in the spring, so this is the last time I'll probably be on campus for a while. So it's great to be back, um, and thanks everyone for coming out. So I'm going to talk about my book today, and I wanted to start by um, giving you just a sense of my professional career and what led me to writing this book, um, given especially that so many of you, you know, have had careers and jobs, you know, in national security before coming to this program. Um, but I was very, very fortunate uh, early in my early in my career, right in my senior year of college. I, I just serendipitously met one of the spokespeople at the National Security Council. This was the end of the Clinton administration who brought me to the NSC in the, in the Public Affairs Office. And, um, and later, in 2002, I was brought back to be a uh, assistant to the National Security Advisors, Condoleezza Rice at the time, and, and Steve Hadley, who was her deputy. And it was first when I was there, kind of around this time, this was pre-9-11 and of course after, I became really struck with the relationship between reporters and officials. And the push and pull to define not just the news agenda for for Americans about about the world, but also how it's framed and like what that story is, and this incredible power that a small cohort of people, really about like a dozen or so, has in creating that news agenda for the elite press, and also um, in shaping the the framing and the narrative of it. Later, I was really fortunate where I was able to go to Kabul, Afghanistan um, with, uh, with the U.S. ambassador at the time, Salman Khalilzad, who's back in the news, if you're following negotiations, um, or, the, or the, the former negotiations with the Taliban. And, uh, and it was there that I became really fascinated with this dynamic still about who had power in shaping the news, because when you're in an embassy in the public affairs section, you realize that most of the news in, in the American press that's being written by your country is being written by the Washington Bureau. It's, it's essentially being shaped by, by Washington and um, not as much what's actually happening on the ground in the country you're in. At the same time, there was this emerging group of Afghan journalists that was being propelled forward by much development aid, diplomatic aid, um, that the um, American embassy, but also the Western embassies um, were spending and, and trying to build a liberal democracy in the country and trying to build a civil society. There's a ton of money going in to supporting uh, Afghan journalism, independent journalism. And this was a pretty remarkable thing, uh, mostly because you had uh, Afghan youth finding a voice uh, for the first time in decades and able to to really shape their their democracy um, and shape the, the future of their country without having to wait their turn which was you know usually tradition and then the last um the last professional experience here i'll just note is that i spent years working with a group called the asia foundation i later left government and moved home to san francisco uh, was very happy i did that and i got to go back to kabul frequently and also spent a lot of time in pakistan and working in communications both for the, the organization, but also for um, doing media development assistance as well. And so I started really going, Afghanistan started becoming kind of a recurring theme in my professional career. And when I got to, um, to graduate school, finally in 2007, and started my PhD at Columbia Journalism School, uh, you know, really the, the encouragement was given my familiarity with the country and the lack of research coming out of Afghanistan to really stick with it and, and try to find um, 
an area of focus in my research that focused on Afghanistan. So that's what led me to this. Um, and this is what led to my kind of this is what led my questions essentially for the research and for the book. And I'll start by framing this because we are in the security studies program. You guys were heavily steeped in IR theory, um, which, which I taught for years. And it really my entry point for all this is, is social constructivism, is, is Alexander Wentz. It's very influential in my research. And the idea of casting identity and recasting identity and that the interaction that states have in the international system. And so, so really, how is the identity that we cast as Americans here at home and that we project into the world, how is that then received, um, especially by the countries that we're, we're talking about um, via our news? And so how, this, how do the stories that we tell ourselves, how does our sense of self um, as Americans, as, how does that translate abroad? And what is the role of journalists in the news media in diplomacy and also in conflict? These were the questions that really inspired me to stick with this research. So real quick, communications research, which I know isn't um, a, a pillar of your studies, just want to give you guys some, some grounding and, and some kind of ironclad truths in, in communications research. Um, First is that the foreign news coverage in US elite mainstream news, so this includes like the Washington Post, New York Times, AP, um, CNN, et cetera, is, is normally nationalistic in the sense that it puts America at the center of the story. It's also ethnocentric in the sense that it compares the rest of the world with US values and the US worldview. So that, so that serves as the benchmark for comparison when, you're, when they're explaining the rest of the world to Americans, you know, especially when it goes to like human rights stories. They'll compare that to human rights in the United States. So, so this liberal worldview that we have of the way you know, democracy should be, that is kind of like the standard bearer um, for, for journalists who are inherently Western and have that worldview. So that seeps into coverage. And the news media has a very special role um, in what Sylvia Weisford, who's actually at GW, says, creating and maintaining a nation in the sense that it reinforces the symbols, it re it's the shared narratives that we have, our language, our culture, and the frameworks in which one can understand the world. So when you're reading you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, you know, normally the world feels somewhat familiar. It's writing about it from an American point of view, and it, it makes sense. Um, and that's because journalists are thinking of American audiences normally when they're writing for you. And so there's that, and there's also other like pillars of, of comms research that just reinforce um, itself as being true again and again. First is that the news, and this is what I, I saw um, early on in my professional career, is that the news largely follows the foreign policy agenda of, of the American president. Mm -hmm. It may not always agree, but the president is the agenda setter for foreign affairs news in, in our press. Whatever he is talking about, focused on, is also going to be what the press is focused on. Um, it's but the other thing is that the, the, sh the scope of the story is more in the political debate over foreign policy in Washington than what's actually happening in the country. So if you're looking at you know, Afghanistan and what's been happening recently, there's the coverage of like, okay, how the negotiations are affecting events in Afghanistan, but really what, what you saw dominant was that there was the whole intrigue over the national security advisor versus the lead negotiator versus the president and the you know, potential Taliban coming to Camp David. And that kind of intrigue and, and political infighting that kind of became the foreign news story more. And, and that's something that is reoccurring in a lot of foreign affairs news. It tends to be fleeting and it lacks investigative work. There's a lot of parachute journalism, basically with a cutback on resources and foreign news around the world, there's a huge dependence on local journalists, and I'll get back to that um, in a few minutes, 
but you know they essentially hold down the fort for the foreign bureaus, and then you have Western journalists parachute in as experts. And the the other kind of recurring theme with um, with foreign affairs news in the United States is that it reduces the world into these dominant meta frames, again, in which the U.S. plays a powerful centric role. Um, and so the the meta frames are security, diplomacy, the economy, humanitarianism, and crisis. But security far um, dominates more than the other the other themes. Usually, you're reading about the world through a security lens and America as you know, having the material power to affect change in that country. And the other thing here that's important to note, out, to note is the asymmetric power of Western and specifically American news in the world. There is what's been called this US-UK duopoly um, over media content. If you look at the news agencies that have the most reach worldwide, it's BBC, CNN, AP, Reuters, and the New York Times. This is coverage that uh, is normally picked up and relayed in local news outlets around the world. And this has been a consistent point of frustration for the developing world. They see this as a form of neocolonialism that um, that in the same way that America and the West has this material power um, through its economy and military might, it also has the power to shape and fix images in the rest of the world, which does affect decision making. So it consistently suppresses um, countries' ability to form new identities in which they can have seats, you know, you know, <laughs> at the United Nations, you know, get loans from the IMF, you know, um, with the World Bank. And so they they really feel that the US news media especially can shape the images of the countries and how they're framed for global consumption, not just Western consumption. So again, these are my driving questions. You know, how does all of this then play out into um, the countries that we're talking about? And again, what's, what are the role of journalists in diplomacy and conflict? So I focused the book, my, my original research was on Afghanistan and Pakistan. I focused the book on Afghanistan because it was just such a rich case study um, and, and wanted to give a long view to uh, the, the US, um, you know, not just the US diplomatic um, role in the country since 2001, but also the media role in the country since then. And so, the time span where I actually did field work um, was between 2010 and 2017. Don't want you guys to think I was living in Kabul for seven years. That was definitely not the case. But um, I was there for uh, you know probably collectively about two years, and, um, and normally would spend summers there. Um, the last trip that I did make was three years ago, like this exactly this time three years ago to finish the book. There was in-depth qualitative interviews with 30 Afghan journalists, independent journalists, um, and about a dozen US correspondents. Um, that's usually the max of how many US correspondents were there. And 12 US and Afghan officials who had a lot of power in shaping the news narrative. And then there was an ethnographic component to the sense that I lived with the Washington Post journalists um, in the summer of 2012, and then I was with um, the New York Times correspondents back in 2016. So the, the book title is Your Country, Our War. Um, it's framed that way because if you are an American and you're, you hear Afghanistan, what do you think of? War. Yeah, security, war. And, and that's, it's, I'm assuming that that's what's driving your perception of that, you know, isn't just that you have the security study students and you're, you're looking um, you know, to unpack the dynamics there through that lens, but also the news media is the dominant story is the war. If you are Afghan, you and you hear Afghanistan, you're thinking that's my country. So it's really the, the tension in these frames that that we produce as Americans <laughs> that's then kind of casted out into the international system. And so but um, and one note about the cover of the book, if any, any, is anyone a Dari or Pashto speaker? The, the tr reverse translation is intentional. So, it's, um, so if you're reading it and you're, um, you're, you know, you're a Dari or Pashto speaker, 
it's, it reverses the meaning. Um, so say, you know, my country, um, my country, your war. And so, so that was, um, your war, sorry, your war, my country. Um, and so that is the, that was the intent of that. Probably a little too clever, um, <laughs> given the, the backlash um, of a lot of people thinking that can't even get the translation right. Here's another Westerner talking about Afghanistan, <laughs> and it's, you know, which was the point of the book, right? And so, uh, but, but so it goes. So if you're so if you're reading about Afghanistan from the American view, there's a couple of things here that might you know pop out. It's first that you know the public opinion um, is truly remarkable. It's it's that this was a conflict led by the, you know, driven by the events of 9-11, almost unanimous support by Congress. Granted, it wasn't just for Afghanistan, it was for the global war on terror. Um, you know, Barbara Lee was the only congresswoman who, didn't, who said no to it, so it was almost unanimous support. You had 97% approval of the American public. And today, it's the longest continuous active troop deployment in American history. Um, 43% Americans since 9-11 this year, or September 11th this year, think the war was a mistake. Um, the casualties, there's been more than 2,400 US troops killed, more than 20,000 wounded, dozens of US diplomats and aid workers killed or wounded, and it's about, we spent more than a trillion dollars by 2017, or spending <clears throat> estimates of 45 billion you know, per year to continue. So if you're looking at this, with the trust, you know, the, the cost to our taxpayer dollars, the cost to um, American lives, uh, then then it's significant, and we're, we're looking at it from that perspective. If you're an Afghan, you're looking at it a little differently. You're seeing the casualties within your own country, which are absolutely horrendous. Um, you know, more than 31,000 civilian deaths, um, more than you know, nearly 30,000 wounded. You're seeing your country at the nexus of great power politics for centuries. You're, you're seeing your, your country being strategically important. So you're suspicious of great power intervention. <coughs> you're, the polling here is also interesting in that 33%, according to the Asia Foundation's poll, in 2018 thought Afghanistan was moving in the right direction. The last time it was a majority was about four years ago. Um, but 61% of Afghans polled were satisfied with democracy, and the majority think that their elections are free and fair. There's a lot of hope for a democratic society, there's also a lot of trust in their news media to be the guide to that democracy. And there's some good news to report. Like it's not all war and conflict. It's that you know they they feel you have Ghani definitely feels like you know he is moving toward this this economic self-reliance agenda and economic reforms. You know, of course, you do hear about this record amount of girls in school. There is this robust independent media. Like there's some good things that have been happening, especially with Afghan civil society, and this this is stuff that should be noted. So, so I'll start here, kind of in digging in with um, how the book opens. When the I sat on this research for a really long time, not quite sure how it would become a book, and in 2014. In August 2014, there's a New York Times reporter who I got to know quite well when I was doing my research, named Matt Rosenberg, who was persona non grata, was kicked out of the country by Hamid Karzai, <laughs> over a piece of reporting that he felt was pretty benign, and it's kind of like deja vu because the report, if you look at the news today, there's tension between Abdullah and Ghani over who won you know, the election. The votes haven't been cast yet. They're both declaring victory. Five years ago, that's kind of what was going on. Um, there, was, there was a lot more fraud, though, um, claims of fraud five years ago. And the, there was concern over how the country was going to move forward because Obama wanted to have a bilateral security agreement in place um, if, if American troops were going to remain. Karzai did not want to sign that bilateral security agreement. He felt he was signing over his country to colonial powers. You know, again, that this was going to be a reoccurring theme in Afghan history. He wanted no part of it. So there was concern over whether or not this BSA was going to be signed. And this story came out 
the New York Times that they thought was so obvious that just needed to be written that the elites in Kabul were really concerned and they wanted to form like an interim administration while allegations of election fraud had been, you know, were being investigated. And um, and that there was some behind the scenes activity in order to put some kind of interim leader to sign the BSA. <clears throat> Karzai was so upset about this story. He felt that what it did instead was that it completely undermined um, his, you know, Afghan sovereignty, that it was him, um, it was undermining his success that he felt he had in transitioning the country to democratic rule, and that the, it was the Americans again trying to engineer something so that they could stay in Afghanistan indefinitely, and that here you had the American press doing the bidding for the American government, and this was the New York Times doing this. So I wanted to start with Karzai, and so three years ago, I, um, I got to sit down and interview him, <clears throat> and as I was leaving and getting my, um, getting, getting my, my things, um, I said to him that you know, there's this whole generation of us, kind of the 9-11 <coughs> professionals, um, that, that really spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and know it's a multi-dimensional country and really respect the people love the country and you know and wish it well and he sat me back down put the voice recorder back on and i won't read this whole quote but he he said to me he's like okay that's fine you guys have all been here you know what it's like how do the common americans though see my country do they understand that like we have life he's like and i just bolded this we're affected by violence of course but we're also a people, we're a country with weddings, with life, with people meeting, there's music, there's culture, there's history, there's night nice season life. Do they recognize that? Because that's not the picture your press has given about Afghanistan. Or have they? No. And it was this really raw moment where you could tell he was really emotionally affected by this, the news that was coming out um, of the American press. And so I wanted to kind of take a step back and look at the kind of three different phases <coughs> of Karzai um, beginning in his tenure in, in the interim administration and then his final, ten, his final term as president. So from 2001 to 2003, there was a lot of adoration for Hamid Karzai. I don't know if you remember reading what was in the news. He was talked about Esquire magazine as like the chicest man on the planet. <laughs> there was this incredible amount of just outpouring that this was our hero, that he was a symbol after 9-11 that our power could be used for good and look what we could do in this country. Um, and then in 2004, there was more skepticism. And this follows not just the media narratives, but also, I think, US policy towards him. You know, the, the question of whether or not he was a credible partner started to arise. And then by 2010, by the time of the Afghan civilian surge um, and also, of course, military surge, it was pretty much outright hostility. There was a very adversarial relationship towards him. Um, I'm sure you've read a lot about this, I won't get into it. But the media narratives kind of followed where US policy and attitudes towards him were going. And when, um, when, I, when I, I unpacked with him you know, this, this story and why he, he uh, kicked out this New York Times reporter, and um, and asked, and asked him about other stories that really shaped his perceptions that the U.S. journalists were actually agents of U.S. government. He said, you know, this is really sad. Like, we thought that the American press, you know, really was, you know, free. We thought that there was freedom of speech in the United States. But actually, journalists, U.S. journalists, and he also thought this about British journalists, they behaved like the Pravda, the former Soviet Union. But Pravda didn't have the mask of democracy on. We all knew Pravda was about you know, propaganda. But the New York Times and others claimed to be free. And for them to then serve a governmental purpose, it was revealing. He, thought, he saw this as an incredible hypocrisy um, of the New York Times and other Western outlets as well. So he often railed publicly about the treatment he was getting from the Western press. And he really did believe that there was no freedom or independence, freedom of speech or independence from the American news. 
So if you walk this forward, and you know, a lot of Karzai's views are shared by a lot of Afghan journalists that I spoke with and Afghan officials. And they see that these nationalistic and ethnocentric tendencies that the American press has and kind of filtering complexity and understanding the world and explaining it to American audiences, they see that as a direct advocacy for US foreign policy. Um, but, you know, again, them being government agents. And they think that US news is a result of careful and strategic leaking by the US government officials. You can see why there's some truth to this, right? Um, US journalists, they say, you know, they, they tell a more, the reason why US journalism is so valuable is because it tells a complete story and motivations behind US action. If you pick up a press release from the embassy or from the military command there, you might get some information, but you're likely to get more color and more of a complete story if you pick up a US news um, piece. And so they look to it, they rely on it, but they see it as a direct connection <laughs> to what's happening in, within the US government. And they think that because the US journalists tend to frame, um, again, the world with America at the center and through a security lens, that that is a direct intention to maintain and amplify American power. Um, and so again, it's a sort of neocolonialism. Karzai really believed that the US press wanted to destabilize his country only so, he could, um, so the US could continue their dominance in the region forever. So, just a reminder, you know, about national ethnocentrism is that whatever clarity journalists arrive at comes mainly from their, their, their senses of both. It's the equipment they use to make sense of conflict, um, and that a lens that puts your country and your standards at the center can really bring a difficult place into sharp focus. But then there's the realities of what it's like to be a U.S. foreign correspondent um, or Western foreign correspondent in the country. It is really hard <laughs> to be one. Um, the sociological constraints are vast. Um, anything from language to security uh, to understanding you know, local dynamics and culture, finding truth is really hard. Knowing finding sources and, um, and incredible interlocutors is just really, really difficult. You have to be there for a long time. As we know, the dynamics for foreign news and the business of news isn't really set up that way. The relationship, too, between US officials and reporters is really dysfunctional. It's mired in a lot of distrust. Um, it's also openly hostile at times. And so this idea that they're partnering you know, to, to write these news stories is, is kind of laughable to, um, to the reporters and officials that I interviewed. But they also really respect the tension. Like, they won't say, we wish journalists, American journalists would just go away. They realize, um, the officials realize that they need to have that as part of you know, the liberal democracy that we are, that, that journalists are playing a role. And, and the reporters you know, somewhat respect the officials and the positions they're in as well. But it really is this push-pull um, relationship that they have you know, for there to be any stories at all. And what the journalists will tell you is that they usually get nothing you know, from the embassies or from officials. <coughs> um, the US journalists admit that they're mainly looking at Afghanistan from the American world, world view, but they do so because they want to keep US foreign policy accountable. So back to like how we see things. We see things in terms of lives and treasure. We see how much money we're spending. We see people dying. Um, and and that's, these are the stories they want to tell because they know that it matters to you all as citizens to know how um, our taxpayers are being, our taxpayer dollars are being spent and how our, our friends and family are being affected inside the country. So, so that is why there's such an American lens. And at the same time, the Afghans want the legitimacy of being in the US news. It's, off, it's valued more uh, often, such a big cobble elites to be in Western news than it is to be in local news. And mostly because they know that if it's in Western news, there's kind of a status conferral, right? This is read by policymakers around the world, but also it's going to make its way into Afghan news as well. And so a note here about Afghan journalists, because it really is quite an amazing story 
the progress um, that they've made between 2001 and 2016, there's really this been this explosion of, of press and, and news media <laughs> inside the country. Um, I, it's not sustainable, but there's about 60 television stations that have surfaced, um, 150 radio stations, dozens of print outlets. The thing, though, about the media landscape is that it largely reflects the power landscape um, that is in the country. <laughs> so, uh, so all the warlords have their own TV stations. Or, you know, I haven't checked them last year, but, but most of them do. There's foreign back channels. Iran has a presence, right? Pakistan has a presence. Indians have a presence. We have our state-backed press that we, you know, that um, is in editorially independent, but it's Voice of America, Radio Azadi, which is Radio Liberty. Um, and then there's independent media, which is where I focused um, my, my research on. And the independent media especially, it's one of the most trusted institutions in the country. It's 64% of Afghans trust their news media. Does any of you know how many Americans trust news media right now? Negative five. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, negative five. Um, and so it, it's really kind of oscillates, like the Asia Foundation poll was the source for this, it oscillates between the news media and religious institutions. So that gives you an idea of how much the Afghans value this. There's just also been this staggering growth in increasing professionalism within Afghan journalism. Um, it's, it's, it's gotten a lot of support in Western development aid um, and, the, and the presence also of Western journalists. I'll tell you, when I first got there in um, 2003, we wanted to focus on developing reporter official dynamics in the country so they knew how to work with one another, like how the Afghan officials knew how to work with the Afghan press. And a typical press conference would be that you get an Afghan official to go up to a podium and an Afghan would ask a question, they'd be like, that's a stupid question, next. You know, like there was no real respect, you know, um, for the dynamic, you know, that, that kind of tension that I said the American officials and reporters respected, you know, there wasn't that yet. Um, and, and the journalists, you know, also would get up and maybe rant about local problems without ever asking a question. So, so it's taken a while for them to get in the habit of, of working together, um, but that, that's improved considerably, and the, the um, media freedoms you know, were definitely championed by President Karzai, but they've been institutionalized by President Ghani, so there's been progress there. Um, but just as kind of starting to wrap up, um, the, when you're looking at this, you know, kind of as, again, like your war, um, our country, um, U.S. journalists primarily frame Afghanistan as a war, they also frame it as a failed state. And, and that leads to like, the corruption news stories. The thing about the Afghan journalists is that they can't stand the war frame. They don't think that's their country. Um, but they really do appreciate the corruption frame because that is what gives them the, that gives them the material they need to do their jobs. And so there's a high degree of self-censorship. I think it's, it's it's changing um, with the times, but but it's really great when you want to publish a story as an Afghan journalist, you're worried about your life or livelihoods or those of your family and friends, you know, from whatever the target story is, you know, um, um, seeking revenge. And it's it's great when the New York Times will take the story or the Post will take the story and then you can relay it as a Western news story. It gives a certain amount of cover. Um, and if anything, what the Afghan journalists said they wanted more of was even more in-depth corruption reporting because it was mainly at you know what's happening in Kabul and not necessarily what's happening at the provincial level. So they have a complicated reaction when they read about themselves in the, in the U.S. press. But this is kind of where I wrap up into like the diplomatic and developmental role of U.S. news. Journalists are not independent observers to conflict or to diplomacy as um, they like to think that they are. They're active participants. They're shaping the perceptions and the normative environments in which decisions are being made um, around bilateral and international issues. They also contribute to this developmental, you know, to the, the development of journalists in the countries they're in, especially if they have a prolonged presence in the country like they do in Afghanistan. And you know, one thing um, I'll say here is that most of the bylines you're reading now in the country are journalists who 
have been covering it for more than a decade. Kathy Gannon with AP has been there for nearly, I think, 25, 30 years. Pamela Coswell, The Washington Post, same, about 15, 20 years. So, so there's been this prolonged presence. There hasn't been as much parachute journalism with the country um, as it is with other foreign, um, foreign policy issues. So I, I do a lot of talks around the country um, through this network that I run called Global Ties. There's a lot of World Affairs Councils in America that, that we work with. And what I'm always asked for is like, well, what, how do you see through the security frame? You know, there's not a lot of power we have. We're kind of given the news media. Um, we, you know, we're given the stories and, and we don't, that, that's all we have time for to read. Um, so how do we see a country and not just a war? Um, I think structurally, there's been some changes, even as I was writing this book, in how um, foreign news is being crafted and constructed. Um, one is that the New York Times especially has, um, has realized that if their sustainability is going to rely on a global market and that they can't just be writing for Americans. So if you look, if you read look at digital, you know, NewYorkTimes.com, you know, you'll see there's Mandarin and there's Spanish, you know, like you can read some stories in their languages. But also what they've been doing and what they um, were proud to share with me is that they've been promoting more local journalists to be kind of lead correspondents in the bureaus. Again, local journalists have been stringers and fixers, translators for for, for foreign correspondents, you know, since the beginning, and there's no way that a Western correspondent can just enter a country and figure anything out without their help. But but really now they've they've kind of transcended and taken the lead on on writing stories. And so the example um, I give here in the book is is Mujib Mashal, who um, writes for the New York Times. Um, in Kabul um, and is the lead correspondent there. So they're trying to do that more so that they're bridging kind of more local perspective with American politics and American foreign policy views. And of course, I know you guys already know this, this isn't really um, the right audience for, for this point, but um, really seeking more diverse news diets and supporting journalism. A lot of the, you know, financially, one of the excuses for lack of foreign news coverage is there's no money for the bureaus. So the more that you guys invest in, in news, um, the better. And also supporting US aid that sees free speech as a human right and, and, and supporting journals and development funds abroad. It's also critical. Um, and then one more thing, because I do run an exchange, um, international exchange network, is that a lot of the Afghan independent journalists that have um, that you know that have uh, professionally developed over the last 17 years have done through done so through international exchange programs, not just ones that are sponsored by the United States, but also going and visiting newsrooms in India and the UK and um, in Central Asia as well. And it, it's it's really important that they feel like they're part of a peer network, um, you know, across the globe that they can look to for support when they're having so much trouble day to day. So. That is my final final note on that, and um, yeah, excited to see questions and um, and offer any clarifications. So thank you. Oh, yeah, I saw a hand. I think in the blue shirt. Oh yeah. So um, recently, it's really I found this uh, presentation very interesting because it kind of uh, gels with something I found myself doing looking back at Charles Krauthammer's columns mm -hmm. about uh, the beginning of our war in the Middle East and war on terror through to like 2005. And one of the things I noticed is just how like, this is a very well respected columnist and how like superficial and very like not nuanced the way we would cover these events was back then in a way that I just think would not be accepted today. And I guess what I'm wondering is, do you think, was your experience like learning about like either people working on site or people who are columnists in mainstream US media. Do you think that there has been over the last 18 years, these have offered kind of a teaching experience for how to do more nuanced coverage of parts of the world that are, you know, relatively different. And, and so like, have we, I mean, in addition to bringing up like local, like people from countries where we're doing this coverage, 
have we learned better because of the, the war on terror and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan how to cover affairs in other countries? It's a great question. I think that <clears throat> the, uh, I think yes, I think journalism about the world, uh, you know, especially US news has evolved. I can't say the same about columnists because they're usually not doing the reporting work. Right, um, they're they're usually relying on the reporting work that's that's coming from their paper or or others. And uh, you know, I would say that um, the the U.S. journalists that I spend a lot of time with are incredibly reflective, and and are the first ones to say where they made mistakes and have a great deal of sympathy, you know, for. Uh, for Afghans and in, 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 in knowing how much how painful it must be to read about yourselves through a US lens. Um, so, so they wish they could do more complex coverage that, that makes a country multidimensional and isn't so pegged to US foreign policy and what the president's tweeting and you know budget dollars. Like they, they want to do that, but <clears throat> the constraints are just really stacked against them. You know, they're they're under uh, deadlines. They have a certain amount of resources, especially um, the ones in Kabul. Only the New York Times had a security detail, so they, they couldn't go and visit sites, you know, where they wanted to give a more nuanced story. So I think that they are um, very reflective and are pushing to do better. Um, but but there's there's just a myriad of constraints that that get in the way. And, and I think sometimes they're able to transcend those and, and write really, um, you know, get it right. And other times they just have to make a deadline and, and, and go with what they have. But um, to your point about learning from the Iraq war, yeah, I think that's one of the most stinging lessons um, that is with especially national security correspondents is how they were in, you know, that was something I witnessed firsthand <laughs> Um, you know, as an assistant to national security advisor at the time, was how a narrative was fr put out, a frame was put out, and because there wasn't an infrastructure by the U.S. elite news to investigate um, and verify that narrative, then that's what was echoed in the press. And so <clears throat> that is brought up quite frequently as, as a lesson learned. So I hope that's a satisfying yeah. answer. It's a mix of things. Yeah. yeah, but the old old habits do die hard in coverage. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm question about the how much African trust is in China. So 64%. Is that just true generally of all news sources, or do you think there's yeah. Balance, right? Like, yeah. Are they discerning these there's uh, viewers of media and like how they differentiate and how they should have it trusting different organizations? And then the second question is on the methodology. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that you came like across, mm -hmm. right? Like, do you have to look to gain access to journalists and like, be able to like, get around the country to find the locations and things like that? I'm just curious. About yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's a great question about polling. Um, it is implied that it's <coughs> independent news media. So it's <clears throat> so distinguishing between that, that means um, there's the most popular news source in the country is uh, Tolo News, which means Sunrise and Dari. Um, it was started by an Afghan Australian family um, whose father was a diplomat when the Soviets invaded yeah. Afghanistan and they, they got stuck in Australia <laughs> and came back um, you know, after 9-11 to help the country and kind of stumbled into the media business. Um, and in that, Tolo has, um, under Mobi Media Group, has gone on to, to also have multiple different channels. Um, and uh, and has gotten the, the backing of the Murdoch family, so mm -hmm. has grown their um, empire and you know into Iran and Africa, um, and so they uh, so so they're probably the best set up for sustainability wise. I mean I think that's like the biggest criticism is that from Western aid is that we we encourage a free press in the country do a lot of trainings but don't think about their long-term market sustainability. So so that is usually what the Afghans are thinking of because it, it's got such, um, it's also terrestrial, it's not you know via satellite, so it's accessible to anyone with a TV and antenna. So, um, so that is usually what the Afghans are thinking, um, that they're trusting, but also it's, it's more complicated and there should be a breakdown because Afghans also trust, of course, um, 
the leaders in their own ethnic identities as well. So that some of the warlords, I mean, that's basically, you know, they're they're leading, um, you know, um, their leaders in their ethnic groups. And so, so it could be, you know, that they trust Austin TV, you know, in addition to Tolo. Um, your question about methodology, uh, yeah, thank you. It was really, it was tough. Um, it took several trips back. Um, I think in the beginning, um, the Afghan journalists were eager to talk. I, I had harder, one of the biggest flaws of the book is that I wasn't able to really talk to a lot of Afghan women journalists. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a, it was around a time where there was a lot of excitement, you know, with with Afghan women being journalists and kind of being in front of camera, and they decided to kind of take a step back after getting so many threats in their lives and livelihoods, um, and being under attack. And so, um, so, so the so the the cohort that was more abundant to me was, you know, the Afghan male journalists who wanted to talk. But then, I think building relationships and trust with with Western journalists took a little bit more time, and that's kind of why I, I moved in with them. Yeah. Um, and so, but it was, um, my travel was limited. When I first got to Kabul in 2003, I was traveling all around the country with the U.S. Embassy. Um, I think I got to Pamshir once, you know, during this time. So, so the limitations are really that it's, it's focused on the Kabul kind of elite um, press that was accessible to me. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you, Professor. Uh, so one of the things you touch on in your presentation in your book was that the, the meta narratives are always dominated by a handful of news sources, mm -hmm. like really big, you know, rich news sources. And this is something obviously that's you know, there's a concern during 2016 and as we go into 2020 for our domestic politics. Like, do you have any practical tips on how to get news so that we're not dominated by MIT and WAPO? Or, you know, because that was one of the legitimate yeah. criticisms on both sides, right? So do you have any, like, on a personal level, that's mm -hmm. just a you know, citizen who wants to be informed? Yeah, I think it's really honest to find, like, diverse news diets and to, to read different sources that challenge our perspectives. Um, and so if you're reading international news, um, it tends to be that, that kind of partisan news sources here, like in the United States, like, they're usually doing the same coverage, you know, the reporting coverage is the same when it, once we're talking about the rest of the world. So if you're trying to get a more complete picture of the world, then you should read non-American sources, you know, about it. Um, for, for our own elections and what's going on in this country, it's, you know, it's each your own. I just really challenge everyone um, to, to read, you know, to see what other sources are saying um, and to think very critically um, question when you think um, news stories aren't complete and and you know do your research you guys are all extraordinarily curious people you're in this program so um, so just you know try not to take everything at face value it's helpful yeah um, so I had a question regarding the, the peace negotiations mm -hmm. whatever they are now um, <laughs> How do Afghan, like just reading coverage about it, it, it like you mentioned, it's very US focused, like um, is it going to be a waste that all these soldiers have died, this and that, but I think um, a lot of it doesn't look at what that would mean for the Afghans. How have the Afghan journalists and citizens kind of viewed coverage of the proposed peace deal and the peace deal itself? Mm -hmm. That's a great, um, great question. <clears throat> if you're looking at it from the Afghan point of view, the negotiations have been incredibly frustrating because the Afghan government was cut out. You know, if you're if you're reading it from the American point of view, you see the lead negotiator is like, well, I included, you know, the Ghani. I yes, we negotiated with the Taliban, but then we would go and, and brief Ghani and the administration of what was going on, and Afghans just felt like that just wasn't enough, um, and so. The, the the Afghan point of view has been like why is it that the United States, why are we calling this a peace process like what like who's defining peace because whatever the outcomes are of the U.S. process we have to live with that and so we need to be at the table so there was this incredible like frustration of feeling left out which is connected back to you know long simmering ideas of, of how their fate has been decided you know by foreign powers and so that so the Afghan you know, press was really kind of reflecting that point of view. If you read the New York Times coverage, 
um, an Afghan, again, you know, um, Majima Shah was doing the, the main reporting for the Times on it. Um, and if you read his coverage, it was almost also this, this um, real desire for something to happen, <laughs> you know, really kind of um, wanting there to be peace in the country and, and, and being really hopeful that this would lead to it. And so it's a mix of frustration and I think also aspiration and, um, and realizing that we can talk about this however we want. At the end of the day, they're going to have to live the ramifications. And, um, and it's, that's really frustrating. Yeah, of course. Is there one particular medium in Afghanistan that tends to be more trusted and give a bigger view of everything that's happening? Yeah, there's a few. So, so there's Tolo, which I mentioned. So TV is really popular, um, obviously, because of literacy issues. And right. also, there's some novelty to it, right? It wasn't allowed um, during Taliban time. And, um, and the fact that the, you know, the, the, the content is Afghan is just really exciting to see yourself um, and see, see your country, you know, reflected back onto on the screen. So, so I would say, tol so there's Tolo, there's um, One TV, which is like one of their main competitors. Um, there's also Ariana, which is heavily backed by the Afghan diaspora and available um, locally as well. Um, and then radio is actually, you know, it's the most pervasive medium in the country still, and it's really trusted. And so one of the most interesting um, things I always thought was that the most trusted radio station for a long time was Radio Azadi, which is Radio Liberty, which our taxpayer dollars fund. Um, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds of the history of US, the US Agency for Global Media, <laughs> but, um, but there's a difference between Voice of America and Radio Azadi. And um, Radio Voice of America was, was created to really promote the American story and editorials and in feature pieces and the news as objectives. And then Radio for Europe was created to um, bring journalism to dark, dark spots around the globe where there isn't really capacity for, for independent journalism. Um, and so there's this joke that no one knows that Radio Azadi is really radio, is a US um, uh, funded news outlet. And so, so no one trusts the OA, but everyone trusts Radio Azadi. So there's also um, a, a print outlet that is very well respected um, by the Kabul leads called Hash de Soap, like, 8 a.m., like it's like your morning paper, and that has taken on more of a, like an investigative role, you know, of, of doing long-form investigative pieces and developing that capacity in the news. Um, there's a news wire named Poshwak and News Echo, which is also created with um, with uh, U.S. funding. But the the dynamics kind of over like what's trusted and what, and I think are still pretty fluid. But these are kind of the main kind of elite, Kabul elite, like Afghan elite publications and, and sources. Yes? What do you think the threat is, given the uh, explosion of um, news outlets, especially television, uh, what do you think the threat is for information operations from foreign countries mm -hmm. like Iran, India, Russia? I know that Russia has an increased presence in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan right now, where there are a lot of pro-Russia channels. Are we seeing other foreign countries do that in Afghanistan? And do you think that there's a real threat to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there definitely, there definitely is. Um, the, there's a, the, the Afghan journalists will tell you like the difference between um, you know, Western support for the news versus um, Iranian, Pakistani, um, Chinese, mm -hmm. Russian is that like that the, the West gives money to support the infrastructure for creating kind of the news and um, gives some training, but then doesn't editorially interfere with content. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like the opposite, you know, is true for those countries. And there's also kind of um, there's there's like there's like pop up outlets, right, that kind of surface for a little while and then disappear. So it's hard to kind of give certain names to. Um, to the outlets because they're they're pretty fleeting, mm -hmm. but but yeah, it's it's definitely the media landscape in the country reflects the power dynamics, which is inevitably laden with geopolitics, mm -hmm. and so um, so it's become you know quite uh, qu quite like complicated. And um, one of the most frustrating things for me when I was their um, kind of the height of like the civilian surge and the military surge with us 
is that I would interview um, military officials during mm-hmm. IO, and um, and they would tell me that you know the same journalists that USAID was paying for in a training, mm-hmm. that then defense would pay those journalists to write stories favorable to the United States, mm-hmm. right? So like our own our own apparatus was kind of working against each other, right? Here's these long-term goals that the diplomacy development community has to develop, you know, civil society in the country, develop journalism in the country, and then here's like the short-termism, you know, kind of um, of, of, of some of, you know, our colleagues in defense. And so, so that was happening for a little while. I hope that stopped. Um, but, but it is, it is, it is ripe for information warfare. Is yeah. there a uh, are we seeing trends of public like, opinion <laughs> um, um, actually being swayed by these um, uh, foreign values? There hasn't yeah. been that research. No. Yeah. There, I mean, there might be um, kind of an intelligence, you know, sure. work that's being done that I haven't seen, but but uh, the the need for kind of sociological research like that is is so important in the country, <coughs> and yeah, and that just hasn't been done. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer on that. Thank you. Of course, yeah. So to, to put things in kind of the third image perspective from, mm-hmm. from the Afghan state perspective, as you have this kind of you know increasing mistrust uh, or realization that, that foreign media is you know, really biased against the US or media is, and you're getting increasingly effective um, domestic journalism in the <laughs> media, how has kind of the government uh, either you mentioned that they were working better with them, mm-hmm. but ha- ha- behind the scenes, has that also translated into any kind of um, either repression or um, utilization as a tool of legitimacy um, because of the perceived transparency? Or how does the state kind of view mm-hmm. that increasing effectiveness of domestic journalism? Is that positive yeah. or negative? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, um, the main criticism of Hamid Karzai was that he would often point to the Afghan press as a sign of progress in the country, would champion free speech. You know, got you know one of his first acts as interim president was that um, one of his cabinet officials jailed a cartoonist for writing, a, you know, drawing a cartoon about Hamid Karzai, and Karzai was away. I think he was here in the U.S. and came back, found out, and like went to the cartoonist and personally got him out of jail. You know, and so. So he was he was really the champion for free speech, but the complaint was that he didn't really invest in institutionalizing those freedoms and also ensuring that the dynamic between um, how the Afghan government officials, of which there are many, were actually treating Afghan officials. And so, so the Afghan, so the Afghan, I mean, we're actually treating <coughs> Afghan journalists. So the Afghan journalists were so frustrated because they're like they're hearing they have all the support that wasn't playing out day to day. Um, and the Afghan officials would rather go talk to Western journalists due to status conferral, to the, knowing they could kill, kill two birds with one stone with the story being in you know, the Western press and then being copied and relayed in Afghan. So I think now um, one of the things that Ghani did was that he, um, he, he assigned or um, appointed a, a uh, activist um, who a who's well known in the activist community and civil society to specifically work on this dynamic and make sure that um, that the Afghan press really was the fourth estate of the country. I still think that there's you know like old habits die hard. So when you have like young enterprising journalists asking questions of elders, yeah. you know, at <laughs> cabinet level, it's it's still this who are you to even question me, um, and and that it's. It, it's going to take a long time to change that dynamic, and we still have that dynamic here, you know. It's, um, but, but I do see things moving in the right direction. A lot of the media press freedoms that um, have been more detailed in um, in through law now, you know, it's kind of a vague reference in the Constitution in 04. and so so that all of that is improved. But um, but really, like Afghan journalists' ability to continue to thrive depends on. The sustainability of the market, and um, you know, having the resources like advertising isn't a norm in Afghan culture, right? So it's hard to find um, the funding to sustain this. And then also, it depends on the 
you know, the re professional respect, as you pointed out, um, that they have to be able to do their jobs and getting access to information. And, and, um, and that tension, that respectful tension that, that um, apparently still exists here, you know, being created over there. So you see it moving in a positive direction as long as the economy stays good. The economy, yeah, and security. I mean, the the journalists, for them to really be able to do the stories that that hold their government accountable, right. there needs to be less threats on their lives if they're trying to do those stories. And that's, I think, what they they fear about the Western press leaving, especially when it comes to corruption stories, because it's it's not just you know um, I go into quite a bit their dynamic with the Taliban, which is one thing, but it's even you know it's it's not just the Taliban or warlords or kind of these traditional bad actors in the country. It's it's also there's some really you know corrupt Afghan officials, especially at the provincial level, and so so going after them you know is 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 taking a huge risk, and um, and sometimes. There's stories that they want to write that their publishers, producers find out about and say, no, that will jeopardize the whole media institution, right? So, um, so they're up against a lot. It's it's really admirable what they're able to do working in this environment. Thank you. And of course, thanks. Yes. So you talked about uh, some of the ways in which Western and U.S. journalists, the way that they portray the situation and kind of the number of. Uh, either prejudices or things that shape their perception, um, things like you know where they're coming from, wanting to hold U.S. foreign policy establishment um, accountable, or kind of a number of the, the different things that shape kind of the, the social construction, the way that they portray the situation. Mm -hmm. Go go when, right? Mm -hmm. um, all right, and you talked about some of the ways that they can maybe do this a bit differently. Uh, talk more about maybe local problems or more kind of people-centric stories. Um, I'm wondering, if, are there some examples of stories that you've seen in Western uh, media already that kind of you think do a good job of portraying the situation, uh, maybe a bit differently from kind of the war frame that mm -hmm. we usually see this, and maybe what some of the impact you think that is on kind of the American psyche and the way that we perceive the situation in Afghanistan? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, the the best reporting I've seen come out of um, the country from like Western news is uh, is really the investigative work that that has been done, um, and that it, and it's the kind of work that like the Afghans really appreciate um, because they feel like it's fair and it helps them do their jobs, and so. Uh, one of the uh, reporters I profiled is Maria Abi Habib, who's with the New York Times now in South Asia, but she was the Wall Street Journal reporter. And, um, and she did a very long, painstaking investigative report on Dawood Military Hospital, which was funded by the U.S. military, um, and, but, but was really uh, neglecting Afghan patients, and it was pretty horrendous, and um, went after the the military leadership, which led to, you know, congressional hearing and, and led to the retirement of this, um, these these military officials. Um, also, the the there's a story about um, the Kabul Bank, the first private bank in the country that was essentially a piggy bank for Afghan elites, um, which which saw to this huge crash um, that that the Washington Post um, stuck with. But I think. Um, like if you read some like uh, some more feature writing that's been done, and kind of don't look really to the Times or the Journal or the Post, uh, you'll you'll see the country explained in, in a more complex way. So again, Majid Mashal wrote some really um, really fantastic pieces for like Harper's Magazine and The Atlantic before he went to the New York Times. But I think if you really want to get the Afghan perspective. It's, it's the journalists who've spent time in the country but haven't lived in Kabul. Like, and so Anand Gopal wrote um, this great book for, you know, um, he's an NPR journalist um, about, uh, I mean, like, you know, no country for good men, I think is the title. And, and, you know, he lived with the Taliban and like spent time with them. He was like, able to give that kind of 360 view of the country. And um, Sarah Chase, um, um, lived in Kandahar uh, for years, 
Um, and so, so it takes a little bit more work, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, if you want to really get a full grasp of the country, it, it's, it's seeking out kind of book length or feature length news articles or investigative length pieces versus these kind of short 500 word stories. Um, and, uh, but I do kind of stand by like what I said earlier about if you read um, stories in the AP right now or Washington Post, you're reading from journalists who've been in the country for a really long time and um, speak the language and have friends and, you know, uh, they're not local to the country, but they've, they've been there for such a long time that they have more authority and they try harder to give the full perspective. So I think that the news you're reading today is much better than it was even five, 10 years ago. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, as of 2016 or now, who do you classify as the warlords in Afghanistan specifically and what uh, media outlets do you or sure. examples of media outlets? The, um, this is this is testing me a little bit because I talk about it in the book, so I may have to reference exactly like where, um, on what page I, I have it. But the um, the world at the time of writing, I mean, General Abdul Rashid Dostum is number one. Um, of course, he was vice president of the country for some time, um, and uh, and he was kind of like the agenda setting leader in. In creating his own TV station, um, it's uh, believe the station is called Ina, which means mirror, um, and but it's really like called Dostum TV. Um, and uh, oh gosh, this is embarrassing. Being um, the the um, the chief of staff to President Karzai, um, um, Horam was seen um, for a long time being a warlord in the sense that he really was coercive in his style, um, and um, he ran a very anti-American uh, TV station called Cobble TV, um, which I think has now gone um, under. But that was especially unique because he essentially took over something called the Government Media Information Center that was created um, with US government dollars to really support this reporter official dynamic and it was like a TV had they had a TV studio and he essentially took that over to support Cobble TV while he was also chief of staff to Karzai. Um, there's about six or seven of them and I'd have to like literally like go through my index right now and be able to to um, repeat them by memory. But um, you know Imran Khan had his own channel, Harat, um, uh, Mohakik had his own channel. I'm sorry? Yeah, no, but these guys all had their own. They were they were essentially really important power brokers in the beginning, kind of as we were forming the government and forming the constitution, and they all saw kind of their new form, their new a new tactic of maintaining power through this new medium that was that was you know becoming more popular in the country post Taliban. Um, Muhakik had his own as well. Um, you know, which and a lot of these guys were running for president in '04, and so this was, you know, a huge, huge um, channel for them. And then um, there, there's, there's a couple more, but it's definitely in there. I'm happy to talk to you after. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was last year the Guardian ran a fantastic piece on um, sexual assault in the uh, War Federation of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, a uh, topic like that is quite taboo on so many levels, but uh, yeah. in, in that society. So are you seeing uh, journalists and media outlets starting to push through into those taboo topics like sexual assault or, yeah. I mean, corruption, you know, they can go after other male figures, very happy to do so, but there are certain topics, like, you know, child trafficking, for example, or that kind of thing that are, people just don't talk about mm -hmm. uh, over there. Are you seeing journalists start to mature and, and say, actually, we're going to yeah, no, absolutely. I think in the beginning, um, especially like uh, women's empowerment and women's rights was something that the more progressive channels like One TV, like Tolo, were really trying to put front and center. Um, they backed off, I think, because it was almost, um, what I was told was like it was a little bit like too much too soon, like putting like women on camera was, um, was, was, was backfiring in some ways. It was exposing them more to, you know, to increased threats. Um, 
But no, but I think those kind of those those social justice stories, um, those human rights stories, are uh, are putting are being put more front and center. Um, one of the criticisms of like early on, earlier on with the Afghan press was that like some stories that were so remarkable to to the Western press, like what came from our sense of like ethnocentrism and like what we felt human rights standards should be. And so when you're when you're a Western reporter, it's like very vivid, you know, to you what should be a story about about um, these human rights afflictions. But if you're an Afghan, it's like, well, yeah, I've been living with that you know, for a long time, like, if, why is that news, you know, and so kind of seeing the newsworthiness in it, like, I think took some time, um, but, but I, I, I feel like that, that has changed, um, the, um, the, the story of, um, Farah Kunda, this woman who was, um, who was killed by a mob because of a rumor, um, that she was, um, she was burning the Quran, um, when she was confronting some people in a, in a mosque about trafficking, I think Viagra um, and something else, <laughs> but she was, but she was, um, she was killed, you know, in, the, in this horrific, horrific mob violence, um, and you know that was a story that I unpack here because it was, it was recognized, I think, by the New York Times and the Western press still as being this outright horrific violation. And then, then kind of made it into Afghan news media, and I feel like that has now like changed more. But it's it's overcoming a lot of uh, just norms, you know, in the society, and 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 figuring out like what is what is newsworthy and, and what the Afghan public deserves to know. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. I uh, appreciate it. And I will stick around for questions if you guys have any. Like, best of luck with your studies.